Let us worship the triune God. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Almighty God, you have triumphed gloriously. You sent your only son to be born of a woman, to be born under the law. And he humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself even to the point of death, even the cursed death of the cross. And therefore you have highly exalted him, raising him up and giving him a name that is above every name, spoiling all principalities and powers and making a spectacle of their weakness and triumphing over them in it. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of your Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, world without end. And amen. The text this morning is from Daniel, chapter 7. These are the words of God. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Let's pray together. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the freedom to gather like this this morning. We thank you for how you summon your saints all over the world to come on this day and worship you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would have his way with us this morning as we consider your word. I pray that you would teach, admonish, encourage, instruct us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. amen. As many of you know, in the uh, aftermath of the Reformation, one of the things that had happened in the uh, uh, early medieval church and late, late high middle ages is that uh, the, the ship of the church grew encrusted with barnacles, uh, and those barnacles were a lot of saints' days. Uh, saints' days, holy days, uh, you couldn't turn around without bumping into a saints' day. And, uh, and of course, part of the problem with too many holy days is when everything is holy, there's a sense in which nothing is. You, you have sort of holy day inflation. And that's what happened. And in the aftermath of the Reformation, one of the things that the Reformers uh, settled on over, over time was to scrape away many of those uh, observances, and they reduced them to what they called the five evangelical feast days. And the five evangelical feast days were simply commemorations of events in the life of Christ. They wanted, it, they wanted them to be uh, focused on Jesus. So uh, you have Christmas and Good Friday and Easter and Ascension, which is what we're celebrating today, Ascension Sunday, and then Pentecost, the celebration of the Lord's giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. So I wanted to give uh, an Ascension message today, and the classic text for this is Daniel 7, our text here this morning, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. One of the great difficulties that Christians have, modern Christians have, is that we do not let the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, inform one another. Because of this neglect on our part, we miss many visions of the coming glory uh, that the Old Testament prophets foretold. The Old Testament prophets set before us many visions of glory. And as a people starved for glory, we ought not to miss any of, uh, any of it when God offers it to us. We ought not to be shutting out any of God's promises for our sorry planet. Now, Jesus ascended into heaven. What does that mean? What does that entail? So, Daniel, in the night visions, Daniel sees someone... And the phrase is, like a son of man. Daniel sees someone like unto a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, verse 13. So he sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. This one, like the son of man, approaches the ancient of days, who is God the Father. The ancient of days is God the Father, and the one like a son of man approaches the ancient of days. And he is brought before him. The one like a son of man is brought before the ancient of days, also verse 13. When this mysterious figure approaches the Ancient of Days, the end result is that universal dominion is then bestowed on him. Dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So this one, like a son of man, comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days, and universal dominion is bestowed on him. The nature of this kingdom was that all people, nations, and languages 
would serve him. Verse 14, his dominion was to be everlasting, and the kingdom that he was receiving would never be destroyed. As Isaiah puts it, speaking of the same thing, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And therefore, preaching the kingdom of God, among other things, means preaching this. It means preaching this event, because this is the place where the king of the kingdom of God becomes the king in the kingdom of God. This is the place where he is crowned. This is his coronation. Remember how John the forerunner, remember how John the Baptist appeared out of the wilderness preaching the kingdom. When John the Baptist appeared, he was preaching the kingdom. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew 3, 1 and 2. So John the Baptist arrives, and what's, what's he preaching? What's his message? His message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Recall that Jesus came also preaching the kingdom. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus was healing all the problems, healing all the sicknesses, but what was he talking about? What was he preaching? Jesus, when he came, was preaching the gospel, that's good news, the gospel of the kingdom. Realize that the early Christians did the same thing. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's in Acts 8, 12. So John the Baptist comes preaching the kingdom. Jesus comes preaching the kingdom. The early Christians were, were going all over the place preaching the kingdom. And behold, then came some of the modern Christians preaching self-care and your best life now. So, let's, let's preach. We're not preaching Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're preaching Jesus as your invisible sky buddy. But your invisible sky buddy is not the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is a clash between what we have drifted into in our modern therapeutic uh, society and what the New Testament talks about. Jesus is the king over all. Christians are monarchists. Christians believe that there's one king, one Lord, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, the thing to note is how Jesus identifies throughout the course of his ministry, Jesus identifies with that phrase, the Son of Man. Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man. He repeatedly calls himself the Son of Man. Now, although th this phrase is common throughout the Old Testament, this passage in Daniel is the only place in the entire Old Testament where it is used in a messianic sense. This is the one place in the Old Testament where the Son of Man has messianic overtones. Other places, the prophet Ezekiel, for example, Son of Man, stand up, Son of Man, do this, Son of Man. So the Son of Man is not necessarily a messianic phrase, but here in Daniel, it most certainly is because the one, like unto a Son of Man, is given universal dominion over absolutely everything. This is the Messiah. So it's a messianic term here, but not a common messianic term. The Lord Jesus uses it of himself and this simultaneously conceals and reveals his identity. It simultaneously conceals and reveals it. Some common examples would include Mark 2.10, Mark uh, 8.38, and 10.33. The Lord Jesus did not want his disciples proclaiming his identity until the time was right. He didn't want demons doing it either. Right? He, he didn't want anybody loudly preaching the identity of Jesus until the time was right. What was that time? When was the time right? Well, after his resurrection and ascension. In Romans 1.4, it says he was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. It says in Acts 17 that God has given proof that Jesus is going to be the judge of the whole world by raising him from the dead. So when Jesus was walking around doing miracles in his ministry, he was doing great miracles, but he wasn't doing unheard of miracles. Prophets in the Old Testament had done similar things. No one had ever come back from the dead the way, um, the way that Jesus came back from the dead. There had been in the Old Testament a handful of resuscitations, but a resuscitation is not the same thing as a resurrection. 
Lazarus was brought back from the dead, and it was the same old Lazarus. Jesus, when he came back from the dead, he came back from the dead in a way that was impossible for him to die again. He was transfigured in the resurrection. Jesus was changed uh, to another level of being in and by the resurrection. So you have resuscitations, you might call them that in the Old Testament, but no resurrection. There's, there's been one unique end of the world resurrection, and that was in the middle of history when Jesus came back from the dead. So Jesus wanted everybody to keep quiet, keep it under their hats who he was when Peter confesses you are the Christ, when, you know, he says, all right, that good, good job, let's keep, that, let's keep it down. Let's not tell everyone yet until the time is right. Well, when he rose from the dead, after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven, and he tells his disciples, when he gives them the great commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go disciple the nations. Now, he says, but wait in Jerusalem. There was still a little bit more waiting. Wait in Jerusalem until power comes on you from on high. The Holy Spirit comes down on them and equips them to tell the world who Jesus is. And now we tell the world who Jesus is because the ascension has happened, because the Holy Spirit has been poured out at Pentecost. So Jesus is raised, Jesus ascended, Jesus is crowned, and then at the, uh, after all of this is settled, after all of this is done, we must declare it until the end of the world. We must preach it until the end of the world. This reality must be declared until all things are complete. And this is what we are charged to declare. The universal lordship over and consequent salvation of the entire world. The king is in his heaven. He rules over earth and heaven. And today is the day that we use to mark and celebrate his coronation. For that is what this passage from Daniel 7 is describing. This is the one, like a son of man, coming into the presence of the Ancient of Days in heaven, and he's coming on the clouds of heaven. He's coming that way, and he is given, in, in, in the courts of heaven, universal dominion. Now, we have to be careful at this point because we, we always want the Bible to tell us what a biblical phrase means. Uh, and, and, and you also want to be careful not to let hymns tell you too much. Uh, there's an old gospel song that says, on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise. On that bright and cloudless morning. Well, the Bible says it's not going to be a cloudless morning. It's going to be a cloudy day. <laughs> All right. the, the same, in 1 first, in first Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 17, uh, the Lord Jesus is coming in the, in, with clouds of saints. It's clouds of saints. And then when the disciples watch Jesus departing, and they're told that he's going to come again the same way he went, he disappears into the clouds. So it's not going to be a cloudless morning. I'm sure it's going to be a nice day. I'm sure it's going to... But it's not going to be, clou it's not going to be cloudless. So we have to let the Bible tell us what, what a phrase means. When we think, but there's another layer to this. When we think of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven... What, what do we tend to think? We tend almost always to think of the second coming. Like I, and I just referred to two passages in Acts where Jesus went and the angel said he's going to come again the same way he went. That will be the second coming. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, he's going to come again to raise the dead. That's the second coming. And when he comes again in the second coming, there will be clouds. So then we see Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. We jump to the conclusion that the only day possible in which there might be clouds will be the day of the second coming. Well, no, there are plenty of places where there might be clouds, and this is another one. So we think of Jesus descending to earth on the clouds of heaven. But this is not what Daniel's talking about at all. Acts 1 is, 1 Thessalonians 4 is, but Daniel chapter 7 is not. The fact is, the fact that Jesus ascended into heaven on the clouds of heaven, the event that we're commemorating today, is not meant, with regard to this prophecy in Daniel 7, 13, and 14, to point to another event many thousands of years later. The Lord Jesus is going to come to earth in the second coming thousands of years after the event that Daniel is describing. Although Jesus will come again the same way he left, his manner of going was the fulfillment, was the beginning of the fulfillment itself. And when he had spoken these things, 
while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he goes into heaven, taken up into the clouds, and those clouds continue into the throne room of the Ancient of Days. So when the disciples are watching him go, they're watching him ascend. They're watching the beginning of the fulfillment of Daniel 7, verse 13. And he's going to come again in the same way. Now we have to consider how the New Testament, I said uh, we, at the beginning that we have to be, take care how the, the Testaments relate to one another. The New Testament quotes the Old Testament, frequently quotes the Old Testament. And we have to look at how those quotations are made. So the first place where this Daniel 7 is quoted is in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now what I want to persuade you of, what I want to show you, is that this in Matthew 24 is talking about Jesus ascending into heaven 2,000 years ago. Now that might, you might stumble over a few passages in Matthew 24, because if you read Matthew 24 through, you will see, for example, strong apocalyptic language, what, uh, what scholars call decreation language, or what I like to call collapsing solar system language. All right, the stars are going to fall, the moon turns dark, the, the sun goes out, everything collapses, it's decreation language. Everything falls apart. Now, Bible-believing Christians uh, look at that passage, the solar system collapses, they go out, they're reading in two th year 2000. 20, they go out and look at the night sky, and, and the stars are still there, and the moon's still there, and the sun just came up this morning, and it's going to come up again tomorrow morning, and they say, oh, that must not have happened yet. It's going to happen, it's going to happen in the future. It must not have happened yet, because they're all still up there. The problem is, remember what I said about letting the Bible interpret the Bible for you. The, this kind of decreation language, this kind of collapsing solar system language occurs throughout the Old Testament. It happens all the way through the Old Testament. In Isaiah 13, it, uh, in fact, Jesus, when he's using this language in Matthew 24, he's quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah 13. And if you look at Isaiah 13, 10, there it is, the solar system collapsing. And then you back up to verse 1 to see what Isaiah is talking about. And Isaiah says, behold, an oracle concerning the king of Babylon. And then you look at Isaiah 34, same thing. And you see that Isaiah in Isaiah 34 is talking about the nation of Edom. And then in Ezekiel, it happens again, and it's talking about Egypt. And in Amos, it happens again, and it's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. And then in Joel, it happens again, and it's talking again about Israel. Everywhere in the Old Testament, everywhere in the Old Testament, where the moon goes out and the sun goes dark and the stars fall, it's always talking about the, the destruction of a nation or a city. That's, that's, the, how the, the, that's how the prophets talk about it. That's how they express it. And so the disciples at the beginning of Matthew 24 say, Jesus, they're rubbernecking through the temple complex. Wow, look at that, look at that, look at that. And Jesus says, not one stone is going to be left on another. This is all coming down which happened in 70 AD, and which Jesus said was going to happen in that same chapter, he said it was all going to happen within one generation. Within one generation. This generation will not pass away till all these things have been fulfilled. And the disciples look at it, you mean not one stone's going to be left on another within one generation? When will these things happen? And Jesus quotes Isaiah chapter uh, 13. Jesus quotes Isaiah 34. And he's using the same kind of prophetic language, saying it's all coming down. So you have to understand that the apocalyptic imagery that, um, that is being used in Matthew 24 is a kind of prophetic language, the usage of which is established throughout the Old Testament. So this is not a sign in heaven, but rather a sign concerning the Son of Man who is in heaven.
The tribes of the earth see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. The tribes of the earth see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, in Daniel, where does he come? In Daniel, he comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days. His authority is apparent on earth. The tribes do see it, but the coming is most apparent in heaven. Put simply, he is crowned in heaven, and we see the ramifications of that coronation on earth. He's crowned in heaven, and we see the implications, we see the ramifications, we see the effect of his rule on earth. The Jews who put Jesus on trial understood the ramifications of this phrase better than many modern Christians do. This is why, tearing his clothes, the high priest considered the statement blasphemous, because Jesus said this, Jesus quoted this passage at his trial. Jesus quoted it as, at his trial, and the high priest tore his clothes. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see, you, Caiaphas, you shall see the Son of Man sitting, where's that? Sitting on the right hand of power. That's sitting at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. You, Caiaphas, are going to see the enthronement of the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven coming in the clouds of heaven into the courtroom of the Ancient of Days to be seated at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Matthew 26, 64 and 65. Mark 14, 62 and 60 through 64. We need to pay really close attention to this because this was the passage that brought about the conviction of Jesus. This was the passage that the Jews, misunderstanding, condemned their Messiah to death, and this was the passage that Jesus, understanding, used to encourage himself as he steeled himself for the cross. Remember it says in Hebrews that Jesus endured the cross despising the shame, and he did it for the joy that was set before him. Jesus knew that on the other side of the cross was a resurrection, and on the other side of the resurrection was an ascension, and on the other side of that ascension was an enthronement, a crowning, and universal dominion. He was going to be given everything, what the devil offered him in the temptation. Here, I'll just give it to you. I'll just, I'll, all you have to do is bow down and worship me. Jesus refused it, not because he didn't want the kingdoms of the world, but because he didn't want them as a present from the devil. He, want, he came to conquer. He came to bind the strong man, as he says in Luke. He says that um, you can't bind the strong man and take all his armor until you, you can't take his armor until you bind him. And he says that the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to bind the devil. And he's going to take all his stuff. Well, what belongs to the devil? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And that happened. That's not going to happen. That happened already. And we're celebrating that this Sunday. This is what we're celebrating. This is what we're talking about. And we have to understand what Daniel's talking about because Caiaphas didn't understand and condemned the Son of God. Jesus understood, and he entered into his glory. So Jesus is the Lord of all. Jesus is the Lord of all. Returning to Daniel, what did the Lord Jesus receive after he departed from the disciples' sight in a cloud? So he disappeared into the heavens in a cloud. What did he receive when he approached the Ancient of Days? What did Jesus obtain? What did Jesus purchase with his blood? The scriptures are exceedingly clear on this point. He received everlasting dominion, everlasting glory, and an indestructible and universal kingdom. That's what Jesus obtained 2,000 years ago. That's what Jesus entered into 2,000 years ago. This is the kingdom that we preach. This is what we're talking about. We're saying that every president Every leader, every civic ruler, every parliament, every congress, every gathering, every gathering of human authority must acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ because we are preaching the kingdom. We're, and we're, we, don't go, we don't scatter through the world preaching an irrelevant kingdom. 
We're preaching a kingdom that applies in the 17th dimension to us when we die. We're not preaching an irrelevant kingdom. We're preaching to kings today a reality, a gospel, a truth, a doctrine that they must obey. As it says in Psalm 2, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. You magistrates, you kings, you rulers, you have to understand that you are under God. You are under Christ. You have to understand, this is something that's really crucial and because we've lost it, because we've, left, we've let this slip away from us in the church, this is why we are facing so many statist encroachments. If there is no Christ over the state, if there is no Christ over the state, then the state is Christ. If there is no God over the state, then the state is God. The state, who's the highest authority in the lives of you who are governed? Is there a court of appeals past the governor, past the president, past the UN, past regulatory agents? Is there a court of appeals past them? Can a man with an open Bible stand on his feet before a lawless throne and say, no, you may not do that because thus saith the Lord? Yes, we may say that, not only that, but because we're Christians commissioned to preach the kingdom, we must say it. We are compromising if we don't say it. The early Christians were not persecuted because they were scoff laws with regard to Caesar. The early Christians were the best citizens that Caesar could have imagined. They were compliant, obedient. They were told to honor those to whom honor is due. And they were persecuted as a threat to Caesar's position. Why? Because they would not honor Caesar as the ultimate authority. They would not allow that Caesar was the end of the road, the end of the court of appeals. Jesus is Lord. This is the fundamental confession. This is why Christians were thrown to the lions. This is why Christians were thrown to the lions. Not because they said Caesar's not Caesar, but rather that Caesar is not Lord. Caesar is the king, he is the emperor. We honor him as the emperor. We honor him as a human emperor. We honor him as a human ruler. But he has a king above him. And we are not going to put a pinch of incense on the altar to the genius of the emperor and the spirit of Rome. We're not going to do it. We're not gonna bow at that point. Not one millimeter, we're not going to bend. Because Jesus is Lord. This is the fundamental Christian confession. Jesus is Lord, not Jesus is my invisible savior, sky buddy, therapeutic counselor. Jesus is Lord. Now, because he's Lord, he also saves individuals, but we don't, you've heard me say this before, Jesus is not running for president, and we're not trying to get a campaign up to get people to vote for him, and if enough people vote for him, then he might have some authority. He has all authority now. Jesus says in the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Daniel 7, has been given to me, and therefore go. Christians are disobedient when they go to try to make disciples. It's not enough to go to make a disciple. You must therefore go. You must go because he has all authority. You must tell your neighbor about Jesus because he has all authority. You must therefore go. So this is the kingdom. We preach the kingdom. The Lord Jesus received the heathen for his inheritance and the uttermost ends of the earth for his possession, as it says in Psalm 2, verse 8. The Lord Jesus received the worship of all the families on earth and the remembrance of all the ends of the world, as we're told in Psalm 22, verse 27. He will receive all men as they stream to him, the ensign of Jesse, as Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 11, verse 10 and his rest shall be glorious. The earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus as the Pacific Ocean is wet, Isaiah 11, 9. And for you kids, that's pretty wet. That's a lot of wet. Jesus has universal authority. He will receive all of his adversaries. He will receive all of his adversaries fashioned by the power of God into his footstool. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Remember, ancient of days, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until 
I make your enemies a footstool. How long is Jesus going to be at the right hand of the Ancient of Days? He was told to sit there until his enemies are made a footstool. 1 Corinthians 15 says that when Jesus comes again, he will destroy the last enemy, death. So every enemy of Christ is going to be, through the, through the ministry of preaching the gospel, through evangelists going out, through church planting, evangelistic ventures, all the things that we are doing, all the enemies of Christ will be subdued and brought under his feet with one exception, and that one exception is death. And Jesus is going to come in at the last, and that's the coup de grace. That's the last thing. He's going to destroy death with his coming. Everything else is going to be brought in submission because he was told to sit at my right hand until all your enemies are made a footstool. He, the Lord Jesus, will receive the human race, unveiled, Isaiah 25, 7. And he will set a feast of fat things, full of marrow, full of fat, and wine on the lees, well refined. Isaiah 25, 8. This world, the one we live in now, will be put to rights before the second coming, before the end of all things. The only enemy not destroyed through the advance of the gospel will be death itself, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And even that enemy will be in a confused retreat, Isaiah 65, 20. And the end, at the end of time, as, as things progress, People are going to say, yeah, you know, that, that, uh, that guy who died when he was 100? Poor, poor fellow. All right? Poor fellow. He must be cursed. He must have done something wrong. He died, he fell off the roof when he was 100. What, hap what, what are we talking about? We're saying death is going to be in retreat, not going to be finally defeated, not going to be defeated until the Lord comes. But the ramifications of this are many. But one of the things it means is that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor toward that end is not in vain. Now, there was a, in political circles, um, there was a joke back in the, oh, I think it was the 60s when William F. Buckley uh, ran for mayor of New York City. There's a book that talks about that called The Unmaking of a Mayor. But um, there was a, they had a campaign button uh, that said, don't eminatize the eschaton. Right. Don't eminatize the eschaton. One of the problems with uh, uh, political revolutionaries is they think whatever their vision of the end of the world is, they think that it's going to happen next week. All right? So Marxists have this vision of the end of the world, their secular eschatology, and they think that they can bring it in next week or next month. That's eminatizing the eschaton. The eschaton is the last things, and eminatizing it means that it's going to happen right on top of us. And, and and people like to uh, sell books and sell themselves by radical predictions of what's going to happen in just a minute, in just a hot minute. Well, we don't know any of that. The Lord says that we don't know the day or the hour when he's going to come again. And I believe, I believe that it's going to be quite a, way, quite a ways out. Um, I, I like to think of future school children 10,000 years from now sweating over the study questions for a test in one of their Christian schools, and they're going over the early church, the early church period, and they ask, they, I can never remember who came, who lived first. Was it Athanasius or C.S. Lewis? All those, all those names run together. We are, we are part of the early church. We are not necessarily living at the end of the world. We may well be part of the early church which means that your labors, what, the institutions you plant, the families that you establish, the children that you have, the grandchildren that you have, and the children that they have, and their uh, faithfulness in walking with the Lord is going to have downstream effects. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So return to your labors encouraged. You know your weaknesses, true enough, but now hear the words of your God. Ours are invincible weaknesses. You have weaknesses, you have foibles, you have faults. But our weaknesses are invincible, and they are invincible because one like a son of man has entered into the throne room of the heavens, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king. He is the one we serve. We call ourselves by his 
title. We are Christians because we are following after the Christ. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your marriage is not in vain. Your family is not in vain. Your children and your grandchildren, that's not in vain. God is equipping us to preach and live his kingdom, to preach and live out his kingdom. And this is why the laughter of the saints needs to be deep and full and rich and filled with faith. One throne stands absolutely secure. One throne will never be unsettled by referendum. One throne will not be touched by any revolution. And that is why you can have absolute confidence in your Lord Jesus Christ. The word complacence or complacency is defined as a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction in oneself or one's achievements. So it reminds me of like the little boy who announced to his dad one day that he was such a fast runner, he was even faster than God. But it's striking that the older theologians use this word to describe one of the kinds of love that we experience from God, the word complacence. The older theologians often made a threefold distinction in the kind of love God shows us. The first was called the love of benevolence, and it describes God's intention and plan to save us from before all time. The second is called the love of beneficence, which describes God actually saving us from sin and death. And the third is the one they called the love of complacence, and that refers to God's supreme delight in his people and his rewarding of his people as being completely perfect and holy and just. It's one thing to see that God's love was determined to save us from before all time. It's another thing to see his love manifest in sending his son to die and experiencing God's love and forgiveness and cleansing and peace. But it really is quite another thing to be crowned with authority and glory when you know you deserve nothing but rags and shame. But this too is an essential part of understanding what Jesus won for you. He did, not, he did not merely fulfill the plans of his father, though he did that. And he did not merely fulfill the demands of justice for your sins, though he did that as well. He also won the right to make his people kings and priests who reign with him. He won the right to treat us as nobility, as royalty, as his own friends. He who deserves all the crowns won the right to give us crowns. He who ascended on high above every name did so in order that we might be seated in heavenly places with him and given a stone with a new name. Complacence in us is usually foolish and crazy, but complacence in God is his glory. He who sits in the heavens laughs, and I don't think we can yet quite wrap our minds or hearts around the kind of laughter this is, but it's good and clean and confident and full of love. And the sign of that laughter, the sign of that complacent love, is this meal. What have you done? Your sins are forgiven. How bad was it? Jesus died and now lives. Lay it all down. Jesus invites you here to his table, to his feast, and he does it with joy, with gladness. He's pleased to see you here. And there's a place set here for you. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. So this is the message. Our Jesus has won. He won. He came to win and he won. And now he's at the right hand of the Father and he's your king. You are his people. He loves you. He rejoices over you. And he's sending you back out in the world now as his beloved people. And you go with his power, you go with his authority, and you go with his joy. So go. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And amen.